Please welcome Elad Ziklik. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Nice to meet you all. Great. Uh, and thank you for spending some time with us today at uh, this AI solution keynote for, for Cloud World. So let's get, let's get things started. So I like to start these kind of things with a lame joke, so I apologize, uh, apologize in advance. Um, uh, but does any of you know the difference between AI and machine learning? So the answer is, if it's written in Python, it's machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's AI. Okay. So, so for the context of this presentation, thank you. That, that worked. Thank you. So for the context of this presentation, I'm going to mostly talk about AI, but we use these terms very interchangeably. So when you want to talk about the state of something, it's often very good to talk about a historical context, how we got here. So I like to start with, when you talk about AI, I like to start with this quote by Arthur C. Clarke. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Think about how somebody from the 60s would, would perceive today's world. Autonomous cars are driving us around. Autonomous robots are, are cleaning our houses. Drones are flying, delivering packages. The world's best cameras, best computers fit right in your pocket. And AI took a while to get there, but there was impressive conquests along the way. Like, I don't know how many of you remember, but 1997, uh, the famous IBM Deep Blue beating the world champion in chess, Gary Kasparov. It was a huge, huge thing. Uh, about a decade later, later, IBM Watson beat Kenji, the human, uh, sorry, Ken Jennings, the world record at Jeopardy. I remember the hype. It was amazing. And then another huge opportunity about uh, uh, Google's AlphaGo beating KG, the number one world in Go, a super complicated uh, uh, game, and AI beat that. And when I, when I was working in Microsoft, Microsoft's AI achieved the top score in Ms. Pac-Man. Okay, this is true. Now, if there was an AI that could beat Fortnite, or, or play Madden, or 2K, or FIFA, I may get my kids to actually study computer science at high school. But unless you're working for chess.com, or, or you're QAing all the Atari or arcade games, how does that help you? The answer is that AI actually made some very impressive conquests in the, in the productive space. Okay, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, six years ago, uh, both IBM and Microsoft claimed superhuman accuracy for speech recognition uh, based on some NIST 2000 switchboard test. And, uh, and a bit later, Google and Microsoft, was, I think like two years ago, uh, their AI models exceeded human accuracy in language benchmark tests. So AI can understand language better than us humans. And also, a few years ago, computer vision succumbed to the AI, uh, AI journey. So AI computer researchers reported uh, artificial intelligence advances that surpass human capabilities in computer vision-related tasks. And if you look at just the last couple of weeks or couple of months, I'm sure many of you have seen this amazing phenomenon that is called DALI, that computer vision GPT-3 powered thing where you give it a piece of text and it generates amazing images. And AlphaFold uh, uncover the secrets of all proteins. Um, if you just look at the advancement of large language models, it's truly exponential. I, I remember when BERT came out, this is 2019, it was the largest model as people were astounded. You fast forward less than three years, and we are at 10x, 15x the number of parameters. We have Megatron, Turing models with 500 billion parameters, and it keeps going. So if AI can do everything better than us humans, if it can see and hear and read and understand better than us humans, it should be no-brainer to use these magical technologies for our businesses, for our applications, right? Turns out that the answer is not so fast, not that easy. Let's take, for example, one of the most commonly used AI-powered devices in the world. Let's talk about Roomba, like the, the magical vacuum cleaner that cleans your house. So if you just let Google autocomplete your, your question, then you see a bunch of mechanical errors, but these are computer vision errors. Okay, my Roomba is getting stuck, my Roomba can't find home. And one of the most famous computer, computer vision problems that Roomba has is if you just add another word to your Google autocomplete, you suddenly see an interesting phenomenon. <laughs> and this is a real image, this is not a stock photo, this was given to me by, by, by a close friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. So Roomba, uh, when it encounters dog poo in your house, uh, it runs over it and then it spreads it all across your, uh, your floor. 
And, and you might think that this is, uh, uh, this is from an ex-colleague of mine called Ashley. You might think that this is Ashley's Roomba and Ashley's dog, but this went so far that the, the, the Roomba creator actually had to respond to this poopocalypse. This is a true headline. <laughs> yeah. We see this a lot. Well, um, sucks to be you, I guess. So, so it's not because the Roomba people or the Roomba computer vision scientists are not great at their job. They are. I actually know the head of science. She's brilliant. It's they lack context. When they train their models, they did not have the context of dogs or puppies running around your house and pooping. So this wasn't in the computer vision models. Now, you'll be happy to know that they fixed it last September. Roomba released a new version that solved this problem. They use AI to solve this problem. But it's not just about poop. Here is another example from yesterday morning. So Zoom has a new feature called transcription. It's fairly new. It's been here for a year. Um, the, the transcription capabilities of Zoom are amazing. If any of you are in Zoom conversations, you can click on the closed captions. It's brilliant, except if you try to transcribe my name. So this is my poor attempt yesterday, 10 times of me saying on a Zoom call, hi, my name is Elad Ziklik. Okay, and you can see the various ways of Zoom uh, understanding. Uh, this was close, but no. Uh, this was really worse. And again, the problem is not this isn't a good enough speech engine. It is a very good speech engine, one of the best on the planet, is that it lacks context. Imagine if the Zoom speech engine could be pointed at the HR database of employees in my company or at my address book, so it would know that Elad Ziklik is a valid name in English. It's a valid word in the dictionary, and that would make it so much easier to transcribe. Because what Zoom does is what you would expect. Like, they don't know that Elad is a valid word or, or that Ziklik is a valid word. By the way, true story, Elad is a Hebrew name. El means God, and Ad means, means eternal. So I'm literally the eternal God, according to my parents when they named me a few years ago, but whatever. So AI isn't perfect. The problem is, for this to actually work, AI needs to become invisible. Good technologies are invisible. When you walk into a room, you flip a switch, there is light. You don't care that somebody wired everything together in the walls a couple of months earlier on. You care even less that some geniuses invented some formulas that make all of this possible. AI, unfortunately, is not there yet. With all the claims of superhuman accuracy, we are painfully aware of all the limitations of AI. We are painfully aware of all the things it can't do, and we continuously hit the edges of where it's not great. And part of the reason for that is that most AI capabilities today, the vast majority for most vendors, are like Lego blocks. Now, Lego blocks are amazing. You can do anything that you want with these things. If you are smart, creative, you have time and patience, you can build beautiful things, magical things. This is from a Lego exhibition that I was in, um, in at, like, I think, a decade ago. Um, this is uh, by Nathan Sawaya, and he has a bunch of other things. It's incredible. But if you're anything like me, this is as far as you get. Okay? <laughs> and most engineers I worked with are like me. Okay? What we want is this. If I want to build a Lego airplane or a Lego Death Star or a Lego Eiffel Tower, I want it to be easy. I want a kit that gives me everything that I need designed to solve this particular business problem. Yeah, I can build the Lego airplane from all these parts that I've showed you in the previous slide, but it's just very, very, very hard. And it needs to be easier. It needs to be more accessible. It needs to do, to be designed to do what I need it to do. It needs to be designed to be an airplane. And uh, turning this back, uh, 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 full circle back to AI, this stuff needs to work more easily for your business. And I know none of you know where this, uh, where this photo is going, but uh, let me tell you. The reason we even need AI today, the reason why with all these complexities and all these fancy stuff we even care is because 20, 30, 40 years ago, all you had to do to run your business was deal with a bunch of tables. Ha! And, uh, uh, and Oracle was great at this, but if you fast forward 20, 30, 40 years ago, there is a shift from, what do we say, from database data, very structured, very organized data, into all data. 
Okay? If, you want to, if you wanted to manage your business a while back, all you had to deal with was your orders table inside your ELP application or, or your customer records inside your CRM applications. But today, if you want to deal with, I don't know, claims automation or, or loan applications, you have to deal with a whole bunch of semi-structured forms and doctor's notes and invoices and manually signed uh, documents. If you want to deal with supply chain management, you have to deal with weather data and sensor data. If you want to predict the stock price of Twitter, the best place to start is Elon Musk's Twitter feed and not anything else, because that is the thing that is driving everything else. So that makes life complicated. So just like store procedures of old were needed to manage databases and structure data, you need AI, you need to apply AI to understand the world around you and further your business. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, one of our customers, Warren Jones, the CEO of SailGP, to join us on stage and talk a little bit about their journey of applying AI to their business. What is SailGP? It's high speed, high tech, high impact. 11 global events and an intense battle with nine nations. Identical F50 driven by the world's best. And powered by nature. Competing on a level playing field where both data is shared and talent actually matters. It's close to shore racing in front of sellout crowds. Join Sail GP in the race for the future, because our race is your race. Awesome. So first of all, thank you, Warren, for joining. Skip, tell us a little bit about Sail GP and where you guys are. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're Sail GP. We're a global sailing championship, and we have events all around the world. Um, the boats that you just saw, they're, they're called the uh, Sail GP F50s. And we call them uh, an extreme IoT device. They have huge amounts of information coming off them. Uh, they have uh, six athletes on board who are, who are wrestling to, to sail these, uh, these uh, catamaran, foiling catamarans around, uh, around the race course. Um, but we have, um, we have uh, events around the world. Our next event is in Dubai in the 12th and 13th of, uh, of uh, November. So if you're in town, you're more than welcome to come and join us. Can you tell us a little bit how you, you guys are using AI to, to improve your business? We, we generate huge amounts of information. So um, everything goes from the boat to uh, an Oracle uh, OCI from that point of view. And we, we talk around billions and billions of lines of, uh, of data that a human can't access. So uh, to be able to have that information and be able to use that information to make the boats go faster, to be able to have the athletes on board to make better decisions of where they're going, this, this, is, this is what we need. And having Oracle AI to be able to tell us little uh, s snippets of information, good or bad, is, is, a, is a game changer for SailGP. Awesome. So uh, I heard that uh, in the last race there was an actual like, hydraulic pump failure or something along these lines. Not sure I was supposed to know that. But can you tell a little bit about what happened and how you identified it? We, we've got so many components on the boats, and they're, they're all interactive. They all need each other to do other things. Uh, and we have sen sensors. We, we monitor around 30 sensors uh, with Oracle uh, anomaly detection. Um, the, the sensors, uh, they scan, the, the boat goes out sailing, it comes back, we, sc we scan the data, and then in the morning, then we act on the data. And, and one of the pressure sensors had failed. Uh, and, and basically, we, we changed it up, the team went out and sailed, and, um, and they, uh, they, they had a great race. Awesome. So I, I heard that you recently like, doubled or even tripled the, the amount of sensor that you're processing with this. Where are you looking to go with AI technologies? It, it, it's endless. Uh, we, we, have, um, we, we started off on a small group of sensors and work out that and get a base model of data. From that point then, we move forward. We doubled that sensors. And over the next couple of um, months and uh, uh, 18 months, we'll be looking to increase that to use it for um, looking at appendages on the boats, life cycles of, uh, of different uh, 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 components, it, it's, it's, it's truly breathtaking. Awesome, that is amazing, and, uh, and I really wanna thank you for coming all the way to London to participate in this and share a little bit about what you've done. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.
And, and if you guys want to learn, if you folks want to learn a, a bit more or a lot more about how this was done and how SailGP actually used Oracle AI services in order to do uh, all of this anomaly detection, uh, Warren has a session literally right after this one here in the Venetian. So you're more than welcome to join it and, uh, and hear from the expert and his team how they use AI to further their business. But moving forward, this was one example of how you apply AI to solve a business problem. Let's talk a little bit about our overall strategy for AI at Oracle. So the first thing that is the most important, and as I mentioned this earlier, it's outcome-driven AI. Okay. You want AI that is like the Lego kits that we talked about earlier on. AI that is optimized for your business, for your industry use cases. Not just general purpose technologies or building blocks that can do everything, but it's very hard to use them. You want AI for your business. You want pre-built AI that solves certain problems, and you also want to be able to customize it to your own business, going back to the Zoom example. I want to teach my speech engine, my employees list, my acronyms, my product portfolio, so that it gets it better and more accurate when I use it. And what I really want, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is I want built in, we call those insight highways. We want to make it easy to apply AI to your SaaS applications whether it's Oracle's applications like NetSuite or Fusion, or whether it's your own custom applications. This needs to be easier. The process of embedding AI into your application needs to be easier. And we do all of that with an improved experience. Okay, we're trying to drive or make it easier to operationalize machine learning at scale using the best high-performance, low-power computers and GPU clusters available to train all of these fancy models and make it easy across your entire personas in your organization, data scientists, developers, analysts, executives, to have a single experience for sharing, discovering, publishing, and using all of these AI stuff in a very easy to use manner. And lastly, we do all of this in an open platform. We get you access to the world's best AI software and hardware, to the best open source tools that you like, and you can run your AI models wherever you want, on our cloud, on hybrid clouds, on multi-clouds, because we don't want to lock you in into a particular environment if you need this to run in other places. Let's spend two minutes on the overall portfolio. I will not deep dive into this. We have a portfolio of 20 sessions over the next couple of days if you guys want to learn anything or everything about any of these things. But in a nutshell, Oracle offers an end-to-end -end comprehensive of offering of AI and machine learning services for data scientists, developers, business users. They want to take advantage of their data. We split those into two layers. I know I said that machine learning and AI are, are, are mostly the same, but the bottom layer is what we call the machine learning services. This is for the professional data scientists that want to build, train, deploy, monitor, and manage machine learning models, custom machine learning models. Okay, we have OCI Data Science, which is our open source data science environment, and we have data science environments inside the Oracle database, whether it's autonomous database or MySQL HitWave, that allows you to run subset of the machine learning workloads, highly optimized to run inside the database, so that in those use cases where you don't want to lift and shift your data out of the database, you can run machine learning directly there. The top layer is what we call OCI AI services. These are the applied AI services that are for developers or people who do not have data science skills or do not want to use data science skills on everything. And they come with AI in the box, pre-trained models that you can just use to apply business problems. You can also customize them for your specific jargon or ontology or business use cases. And this is part of the suite that we call OCI AI services. And to make it easier to do this, we actually spend a significant amount of time embedding these capabilities directly into where you need them. Both making it easier for ISVs and system integrators to apply AI to their business applications, as well as integrating this directly into our business applications so that you can use this out of the box. For example, NetSuite just launched uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago in Sweet World a new AI-powered accounts payable automation to automatically process bills and invoices powered by our suite. All of Fusion's AI in their HR applications, their ERP application, is powered by the same platform. So not only are we doing this to make the applications better, we're also eating our own dog food, or as I heard from my marketing counterparts, drinking our own champagne to make sure that these things are highly powerful, highly scalable, and enterprise-ready for you to use. 
For example, we integrated our computer vision suite into our Oracle Analytics cloud portfolio, into our BI dashboard. So now you can actually, inside your BI application, go and, and draw bounding boxes around the objects that you care about to be able to count them uh, in, a, in a retail store or in a parking lot or in whatever without knowing anything about computer vision. It's just a built-in experience with the most powerful deep learning computer vision technologies inside your BI dashboard. Now to talk a little bit more about where this is going and where the future is when we talk about the last mile of AI delivery, please join me in welcoming to stage David Luan, the CEO and co-founder of ADEPT. All right, thanks a lot. So at ADEPT, we're building a natural language interface to your computer. And uh, people have had this dream for a really long time that you should be able to get your computer to do anything you want it to do by just talking to it, kind of like how I'm talking to everybody here. Um, and specifically what I'm referring to, though, isn't actually all the simple stuff of uh, being able to just like, ask what your voice assistant would do for you, like um, set an alarm for me or find me the weather. I'm talking about the like, actually super high value useful things, the kind of stuff that you might actually ask a colleague to help you with. So for example, like, build me a financial model for this company I'm thinking about buying, or, uh, or you know, make me a part for an F1 car. And that's actually exactly what we're working on here at ADEPT. We're building basically a natural language interface that's super general and super flexible that lets you do anything that you can basically put into words on your computer. So um, people have had this dream for a long time, and like, why hasn't this happened, right? It's actually because like, this massive advancement that we've seen in the last couple of years in large language models was required in order to even get started doing something like this. Like, you needed to be able to train these models that actually understood what you meant. But actually, that's not enough, right? Like, you go to something like GPT-3 or the model that we trained at Google, like Palm, and you ask it, um, buy me a pizza from Domino's. And it just pretends like it's the customer service bot and makes up all the stuff, but you actually never have anything that shows up to your house, right? And the next step, though, of actually being able to make this work is you actually have to teach these models how to use the same software tools that you use every day. And that's precisely what we're doing at ADAPT. To solve these open problems, we created this model called, uh, we created this model called ACT1. And what it is, is it's actually a new class of large neural network that has a couple of different, um, has a couple of different new capabilities. First, it understands precisely what, you're, what you mean when you ask it to do something, but it also actually understands the context of the tools that you actually use every day. So it knows, like, it knows that like, what you're, like, it basically is able to see what you're doing on screen and has an understanding of, uh, of what you're actually trying to achieve. And most importantly, it knows how to break down your intent into a bunch of different actions and actually actuate the, your computer to go get those things done. So what we, the way we train it, actually, is, um, is we have two different phases to this. In the first phase, we take all of the knowledge that's present on the internet, basically, like all of the world's knowledge, and we distill it like right into the model. So the model's basically read all this text on the web, and it understands how tall Mount Everest is. It knows, uh, it knows, what, uh, it knows what EBITDA is. And then we show it lots and lots of examples of people actually doing useful things on your computer. And by doing that, it now has the ability to use any software tool that you might actually use every day. So when you put these pieces together, you give it a ton of data, you give it a ton of compute, and as we know, the more compute and data you give these models, the more predictably better they get. You now end up with something that can take your intent in natural language and then just turn it into like, whatever sequence of tasks actually needs to get done on your computer. So we're super, super stoked about this because a general flexible system like this has actually never been done before. And, uh, and so I wanted to go show you all some demos of this model that we trained called Act1 and what it can do. So first thing is we train it how to use a web browser. And here's a toy example of it using Craigslist. So you ask it, find me a refrigerator under 1K. And it knows how to use all the UI elements that you actually use every day. So it goes and sets a filter for $1,000 and pulls something up for you. But it also knows how to go across software tools. So you ask it, send a message to the seller to ask if I can pick it up tomorrow. And it actually goes right over into, finds the email, goes to Gmail, and then writes that email for you, and then, and then hits send. So this kind of like general flexibility has like really never been seen before. But um, the reason why we're really excited to be here today is actually we have been working with Oracle to teach Adept how to use NetSuite, which is a collection of uh, small and medium-sized, uh, or applications for small and medium-sized businesses. So here what we did was we taught Adept basically how to use NetSuite like a normal user would. So ask it something like, who are my top 10 customers based on sales orders? And it'll go right into NetSuite, use the same UIs that you do, and actually pull that, pull that right up for you. 
which this is like really, really just the beginning. Here's like a very, very simple example, right? But if we go and uh, if we go and actually like look at like even more complex things that it's possible to, to do with a system like this, let's go to the next video. Um, let's go to the next video, thanks. Um, here's something that actually I honestly barely even know what half the words in the sentence means. It's can you run asset depreciation on furnitures and uh, and all this other stuff in, in, in the UK subsidiary. Um, and the model is basically, because it has all the world knowledge that it has, is actually able to just actually go, go directly get this done for you. So, um, so like, I think what's super powerful about this is Adept gives all non-experts the same capabilities that experts would have actually, like, or can do, and you, just makes it available to everyone through natural language. So like just each one of these commands is so incredibly complicated. There's so many different things that you have to go remember to go click the whole workflow. Like it would have taken so long for me to actually learn how to do this. And now it's all of this knowledge has been baked into this underlying model. Um, cool. Next video. So um, just as a bonus, right? In this case, um, in this case, we're able to ask the model to uh, generate a PDF of the sales uh, back orders uh, report, right? Like. All these things that you would actually end up doing every day. And so um, what's super interesting about what we've done with Adept is that like, this is just the very beginning. Like, as you can see from this, it's going to be super possible to do any tedious thing that you do on your computer just through natural language. And our um, work to actually make Adept work on NetSuite was, has only been for the last week. So like over just the last couple of days, the Oracle team collected some training data for this. We fine-tuned our model over the span of a couple hours, and it's already gotten here. Like just imagine what this is going to be in six months. We've had a lot more time to train and scale all this stuff up. So that's why we're really, really excited about the future for what we're doing at Adapt. Like we just have this, uh, we have this uh, ability here basically to be able to do like to be able to transform knowledge work and just give everybody a natural language interface to whatever it is they want to do on their computer. So, awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. So, so this is a great example on how you can take things that are mind-bogglingly complicated and need certified geniuses in order to go and build and train and make them available on OCI. So we started the work with NetSuite and we're gonna make this available for anyone, any application developer that wants to add this kind of experiences into their application or, or website. Which leads us to the next segment where this is my goal, okay? This is our strategy and goal. The goal is not to build the best AI things in the world and, and you will be limited to the things that our researchers and scientists can do. It's how we get the best AI software running on the best AI hardware with OCI so you can build the best AI things that you want to build. And to talk a little bit how we're going to do this and how we are doing this, please join me in welcoming Ian Back, the VP for Hyperscale and HPC at NVIDIA, and Peter Wang, the CEO and co-founder of Anaconda. Thanks for joining. So, so Peter, uh, could you please maybe get us started with uh, talking a little bit about what's Anaconda and who are your customers and what is it that you do? Yeah, so, uh, cool. so Anaconda is uh, the world's most popular open data science software platform. Um, we deliver all sorts of open source libraries and packages to over 30 million users. And we're used by researchers, we're used by practitioners, um, students, teachers, just everyone who is doing AI and ML and data science. And, and how and where do you see open source software driving innovation in AI? Well, the, the reality is today, almost all of the innovation that happens in AI and ML um, is being done in the open source. And that's if you're using you know, low level uh, data tools, basic data science tools like Pandas or Scikit-Learn, or if you're using a, the most cutting edge AI software uh, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, and, and all these things. All of these things are being built by a global collaboration of open source developers and, and researchers. Um, so the innovation is all out there. It's uh, you know the AI gold rush is is actually really cool because it's the the genes and the shovels are free. It's all out there, um, and it's just up to businesses to lean in and adopt that. Yep. And the thing is that businesses, especially enterprises, are still very hesitant to, to adopt open source at scale. Like they worry about security vulnerabilities, broken software supply chain, like. How does Anaconda help with this, uh, with this mess? 
Yeah, um, it's, it's understandable that, opens, that uh, enterprises are a little hesitant to adopt open source um, of this form. In particular, in the last year, for instance, we've seen a lot of attacks on the public infrastructure that the software developers use to build open source software. So it's completely understandable. But what Anaconda does to help mitigate this is we actually take the open source software code, the, the source code, um, the recipes, if you will, and we go and build the actual binary artifacts, the software that people would install and use. We do that uh, with a lot of care and curation. We do it on our um, you know, governed and enterprise grade um, uh, infrastructure. And that way, businesses um, and, and, and platforms like Oracle, um, you can adopt these things and feel confident that they're enterprise grade, they're secure, uh, they're backed by you know, a, a, a vendor like Anaconda. Um, and in doing that, we're hoping to allow businesses to lean in and adopt open source uh, AI and data science um, at, a, at a much faster speed. Awesome, thanks. So as we're talking about uh, open source, a lot of the use cases are involved like very large compute, uh, compute intensive high powered computer generation. Uh, and this is where NVIDIA comes into play. Like NVIDIA, uh, Oracle was, Oracle Power was one of the first to deliver the NVIDIA A100s to its cloud platform. And uh, as you may have heard this morning, like we are uh, gonna be one of the first to, to uh, offer the new H100 uh, uh, GPUs. Uh, can you tell us, Ian, a little bit about these groundbreaking H100 GPUs and the impact on AI? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, NVIDIA is an interesting company. We're the, uh, being the AI platform company, we're the one, we're an AI company that works with every other AI company. So with every architecture generation, we, we aim to, you know, make it groundbreaking for the latest of what AI has and what AI needs. Um, in, in the H100, we specifically designed it for the large language models that we heard about earlier. Um, it's designed to actually train, these models are huge. They're trained on basically the corpus of the entire internet and, uh, and then turned into, that capture not just uh, understanding human language, but really human understanding as we saw. Uh, the new H100 Hopper GPUs are designed to both train and deploy these and really democratize this technology. It's actually nine times faster to train uh, compared to our previous generation and 30 times faster for deploying it or inferencing. This dramatically reduces the cost for deploying these models and takes it out of the hands of the sort of global you know, giants and into the hands of every enterprise to deploy the technology. So as AI gets more mature and better, like. Various enterprises, various businesses are in different stages of the AI-driven transformation journey. How can enterprises at scale tap into the power of NVIDIA's platform and OCI and leverage it to actually make a business impact? Yeah, NVIDIA has been investing hugely, not just in the chips itself and what the technology can do, but all of the software that goes along with it to basically accelerate every part of the, of the data science and AI pipeline. You know, starting with data prep, uh, model prep, the training of the model itself, as well as the deployment and inference and operating of the, of the model. Uh, so we have developed a couple of, of technologies to do that and incorporated them into platforms like OCI, either as a bare metal service or into the actual services themselves. Uh, NVIDIA has NVIDIA AI Enterprise, so we have direct enterprise support for all layers of the software stack. And we're increasingly building tools to help enterprises you know, deploy these technologies. Like the large language model uh, that was discussed previously, you know, we've worked on prompt tuning. Take a huge large language model that was trained on the internet, you know, it'll answer a question as if the internet answered it, which isn't necessarily useful for enterprises, but with, with some of the prompt tuning technology, you can give it a, couple, a few hundred examples of how you'd like it to answer the question, and now you have a purpose-built large language model that can be deployed for your use case that's tailored and answered in the way that you want to hear. Yeah. So one more question to you, Peter, as I'm, as I'm hearing Ian, Ian speaking. There seems like there's always new computers, new processing units, and, and that makes um, supporting open source uh, across a diverse set of hardware very challenging. Like, how does Anaconda deal with this and help the industry? Well, it's, it is definitely an issue. The industry is uh, kind of, is an industry-wide problem, right? We have a diversity of chips, hardware, different kinds of software being built by different teams. Um, and, and there's no free lunch, unfortunately. So historically, over the last 10 years, what Anaconda has done is acted as somewhat of a steward and a, and a middleman between you know, the hardware vendors, um, the, the big, big major platforms, um, and then um, the actual upstream open source software developers themselves. And we, uh, you know, we do a lot of the building. We go and do a massive test matrix against all different kinds of hardware, software, 
architecture, operating system versions, and things like that. Um, but we can only do so much as a single entity, right? So moving forward, um, we're really looking forward to um, you know doing the diplomacy and the networking and working with partners like Oracle and Nvidia and all these open source projects to uh, build better standards and you know really converge on some approaches so we don't have this combinatorial explosion that becomes very difficult for everyone to manage. Yep. But yep. it's definitely a work in progress. Yep. Makes sense. So maybe one last question, Ian. We talk a lot about general purpose platform, but I know that Nvidia also has a lot of investments in healthcare specific platform. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we heard a little bit about that today from the keynote. Um, uh, NVIDIA has been investing in, in vertical software stacks, frameworks that you know, get, get almost to the last mile of the, where the customer is and meet the enterprise developer you know, where they are. In healthcare especially, we have a platform called NVIDIA Clara, which is a specifically designed platform for, for healthcare for both medical imaging and genomics research. Uh, and it's being actually integrated with Monai, which is a, 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 a medical online uh, community for deploying AI, it connects doctors with data scientists to build models that can help uh, radiologists and, doc and others uh, deploy AI models for healthcare. Um, so we're bu helping build these platforms together with industries, with doctors, and with data science, and then making it all available on Oracle's cloud. In fact, you know, developers uh, and users of Oracle Cloud can now get access to literally supercomputer levels of performance uh, to deploy and develop their models for their businesses. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate you coming over to joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Ian mentioned healthcare, and you heard about this in, in, in Safra's keynote uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about healthcare and AI as, as we wrap this up. Like, so, I'm sure you're all aware or mostly aware that we all just finished the acquisition of, of Sono. Um, uh, and we are using this opportunity because I think it's a great opportunity to bring together the power of general purpose cloud and AI and healthcare. And tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing and what the future could look like, I'd love to invite Bob Robke, the, the VP of Strategic Growth from Oracle Sono, to stage. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Elad. Good morning, everybody. As Elad mentioned, I am the VP of Strategic Growth at Cerner, Oracle Cerner. Um, and I'd like to, uh, to review a, a couple of things that we're gonna work on from a demonstration standpoint with uh, using Oracle AI. So I'm gonna frame the, frame the conversation here a little bit. Um, so as we deal with healthcare organizations throughout the country and throughout the globe, actually, um, they repeatedly, uh, year over year, will, will those first two bullets, how do I deliver the most safe, and quality care uh, under the financial constraints of what I of, of my environment. Those are always on there. Recently, with COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, staffing shortage has risen to that list, risen, risen up to the top. Staffing has hit every industry, but has hit healthcare especially hard. Now, Cerner has a lot of <clears throat> well, a lot of um, a software and solutions to address these three issues, as you see on the screen, but Inclusion of Oracle AI will, will elevate those solutions for sure. So I'm going to paint a picture of specifically one, one problem. This is falls, patient falls within the hospital. Um, for those that aren't familiar with healthcare, this is a pretty big problem. One, because there's a lot. There's between 300, or I mean 700,000 to a million falls every year. When those occur, about a third of them or so are considered serious. Uh, and then they require the hospital to take care of them. The thing to remember is that the hospital cannot reimburse for, those, uh, for that care, for those, for those falls. So what that does is it exposes them to uh, quality issues with um, uh, what they're dealing with, their quality and patient safety. It also hits them directly to the bottom line. So it's a very big problem our clients deal with today. Now, most, most healthcare organizations today solve this by hiring what is called sitters. So if you've heard of a sitter, they are literally people they hire, sit in the room, watch a patient that is deemed a high falls risk 24-7. Some, some healthcare organizations have several hundred if not thousands of these patients in their rooms every day. So, um, can you go back a slide? So I'm going to show you what we're with, through the powerful, through the power of Oracle AI, how we can change that. Um, all right, 
I'm going to show you. We have a two-way audio video set up in the room. We have a patient here that is uh, in bed and is deemed a high fall risk patient. So <clears throat> one other thing I'll mention here is, is because uh, healthcare IT is typically very uh, succinct with um, uh, patient, or patient uh, identity, uh, we always have that in front of our mind in terms of do we need to protect this patient's identity. So we have that ability to do that. So I'm going to fast forward, remove that, and show you what this demonstration looks like. So patients in the room, uh, computer vision is checking, OK, I can identify the patient. I can identify objects in the room. I can even identify things that are on the floor that may potentially be hazardous to that patient. So as a patient begins moving around in the bed, you can see the green box. The green box says it hasn't reached the threshold of, of a problem. But as soon as they hit the yellow, we got a notification that the patient's trying to get out of bed. So we can, what we can do then is interact. In this particular case, we have a, a monitoring tech that can interact with that two-way video and say, hey, uh, patient, we see you're trying to get out of bed. We will call the nurse, have them help you out. Please get back into bed where it's safe. We automatically alert the nurse. The nurse then can come into the room and handle the patient, uh, or handle the patient's needs. Now, very simple use case, but very, very powerful and very easy business rationale for around this. All right, I'm gonna do one more. This is around pressure ulcers. So those that haven't heard of that, of a pressure ulcer, it's basically a bed sore. Cert certain patients are higher risk than others. And so what the, 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 the the knowledge around this is if the patient is over that, um, in that position for more than two hours, they are higher risk for bed sores. And those, just like falls, those are not reimbursed. So we are watching this patient. As Soon as they hit that threshold of two hours, it alerts the nurse. The nurse then can come in and switch the patient over to the other side. As that's occurring, uh, we automatically do the documentation that this has occurred in the electronic medical record, which would be a, a, a manual thing that the nurses have to do today, uh, less, thus alleviating, alleviating their need to document. As soon as we get them in a better position or in the position, the, the clock starts again, and bed sore risk alleviated. So you can see, again, very simple, but very powerful. Healthcare has got thousands of these kinds of use cases around it, where right now we do typically use people in their, their eyeballs to use. So looking very much forward to Oracle, to our collaboration with Alad and his team and the use of Oracle AI in healthcare. So I will turn that back to Alad. Thank you. Thanks. So, so this is a great example of, of how we not only have the technology to do this using powerful computer vision models, we actually have the last mile of AI to integrate this into where it needs to be. Into the, in this case, the CERN or patient observer applications. So with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining me in this, uh, in this session. Come join our other AI sessions or join us at our AI demo booth in the, in the expo world and see ML and AI services in action. Thank you very much for joining. Hope you have a great car. Thank you.